I am very happy to welcome Jason Anderson and I am sure that his session will be interesting, informative and inspiring. Over to Jason. You want a book? No, 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 we got this. Thank you very much. Okay, first and foremost, thank you to the English Language Teachers Association of India and to the British Council India for inviting me to speak here at the Altai Conference. It is a great privilege to be here and also to spend some time in the beautiful state of Kerala. I've really enjoyed the talks I've attended so far. I've seen so much innovation and some really interesting discussions as I've just seen. So the opportunity to speak here came at a very timely moment in my career. Ever since leaving the comfort of European classrooms over 10 years ago to work in Africa first, where the conditions are quite similar to the gentleman who talked about the challenges working with tribal schools, and more recently in Asia, I felt that current approaches, often disseminated worldwide, tend to originate in a Western monolingual myth of the 20th century. Even today, as writers, methodologists and teachers around the world are embracing more multilingual approaches, the pull of English only, or English mainly, is still strong and pervasive. My recent research has led to me asking some different questions in a bid to understand what a more L1 inclusive approach to language teaching would look like. And I have often found myself looking towards India for inspiration. Thank you. And I should clarify, when I talk about L1, this is a loaded term. I'm referring to all the prior linguistic and cultural resources of the learners, plural, and the learning community, what Agar calls language culture. As you may have seen from my abstract, today's talk asks whether multilingual countries such as India can take a different path to effective competence in the use of English when compared to the more monolingual West. But that's another dangerous dichotomy, Dr. Father Paul. We will begin this talk by exploring and confirming our own understandings of translanguaging briefly. We will then look at the L1 use question and I will suggest that we need to move from current ideas of minimal use of L1 to classrooms which are truly L1 inclusive. I will then report on some recent research that I've published from the UK on adult language learners studying there, which is of relevance to the talk, and then invite you to discuss how that links or not to teachers, to students that you work with. This will lead to an examination of current L1 use practices in India uh, based partly on some research I conducted with Amy Lightfoot from British Council India. And towards the end of the talk, I will share some practical ideas as a practicing teacher that encourage more translingual practices in the language classroom. <clears throat> Both from my own experience as a practicing teacher and from respondents to the survey, translingual teachers in India who have demonstrated innovative approaches to translanguaging that I would like to share with you. And please beware. I will be asking you to discuss a few questions in pairs, so please be ready. And here's the first one. I'd, li I'd like you just to turn to the person next to you and ask them this question, just for one minute, to share your current understandings of the word translanguaging. One minute, please. Okay, thank you. On the screen you can see a really interesting example from a film you may be familiar with called Jab We Met. It's one of many Indian examples I use when I'm trying to convince my colleagues in the UK that translanguaging is a natural part of our heritage. I suspect I will not have the same difficulties convincing an Indian audience where translingual practices are widespread. Here it is normal to blend or mesh languages in texts, in sentences, in phrases, and even within words. I love these, I'm all better at it. I find it difficult to explain to some British and even American colleagues that Asians and Africans don't do this because they can't keep languages separate. They do this to enrich language as a greater whole. But translanguaging is common around the world, 
I've worked a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, and I can tell you that it's just as common there as it is in India, in some parts of it. On the left, you can see an example from a rap song from Kenya involving English and Kiswahili. And on the right, an example from Malaysia, from a WhatsApp conversation between a group of teachers I worked with a few years ago. So, from a translingual perspective, language is not seen as a number of discrete systems, languages such as Hindi, Bangla, Gujarati, etc. It is seen as a much more holistic, fluid entity. As users, we are not seen to know or speak separate languages, but to have a repertoire of linguistic resources that we make use of, depending on the context, the interlocutor, the person we're talking to, and the function, what we need to do with language. And we may make use of resources from different languages at different levels. Have a look at the second line of the rap song on the left. It says, Hatakama Siku Murda, which would mean, I didn't murder, using the Kiswahili prefix, I didn't, and the English verb murder. We can also blend languages within sentences and between sentences, as code switching often describes. But we can also do so at larger scales when we work with whole texts. Translation is the obvious example, but in fact there are more common work activities such as, and I don't know if you've ever found yourself in this situation, you're on the phone to someone speaking one language, looking at a computer screen with information in a different language, and you're summarizing from that screen. Think about what's happening in here, translingual practices. That's also translanguaging. And many of us suspect, we're pretty sure, that translanguaging is on the rise worldwide as the use of internet and social media, a very common topic here at the conference, are making national boundaries less important and migration is bringing people together from many different cultures, cultures sorry, especially in large cities. So these examples from Jab We Met and the rap music indicate that translanguaging is also an artistic phenomenon despite the more conservative practices of publishing houses, they have often led to the exclusion of translanguaging from prose literature. Indian authors like Chetan Bhagat, and I know Kishori Patel, if she's in the room, was talking about this very novel, they have often had to ask us to imagine translanguaging. But exceptions do exist, including arguably one of the greatest novels of all time, which was a translingual novel. Any ideas? War and Peace. You can see the Russian and the French blended here on this early excerpt from the novel. Tolstoy's War and Peace was translingual, originally written in Russian and French to deliberately explore the relationship between language and identity for an aristocracy who had become dependent on the language of a country that was now invading them. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Okay. Now many people ask, what's wrong with the term code switching? to describe these practices. Well, the problem with code switching is that it tends to imply that languages are fixed neatly and separated like the colors in this painting by Mondrian, and that we simply move between them. But that isn't what happens. Translanguaging sees languages like the colors in this painting by de Kooning, still definable, but blending and mixing. Now imagine that the paint isn't dry and that we, as users of the language, are constantly manipulating it to create new colors, new meanings, through our interactions. And this is what Indians do as, arguably, the greatest multilinguals on the planet. But at this point, I think I'd rather invoke an Indian author. And the perfect way to explain it is to take the metaphor of a rainforest, as Sridhar did in his 1994 paper, A Reality Check for SLA. I'm just going to read it out. Salita said, what we need is a more functionally oriented and culturally authentic theory, one that is true to the ecology of multilingualism, and views the multilingual's linguistic repertoire as a unified, complex, coherent, interconnected, interdependent, organic ecosystem, not unlike a tropical rainforest. And the theory that he was talking about was translanguaging, but at that point it hadn't really been invented, or at least hadn't really been used in language teaching contexts. This is also before Vivian Cook disseminated his idea of multi-competence, if any of you are familiar with it. But Sridhar's metaphor is better, his ecosystem is better, because it does not imply that these are separate things. Now over the last two or three decades, 
attitudes towards L1 use have changed in language teaching communities in the West. First gradually, then more rapidly, leading some, some to suggest, as Stuart May has, that we are going through a multilingual turn in our approaches to language teaching. Of course, before this happened in the West, and since it happened, plenty of Indian teachers of English have adopted more pragmatic, social-culturally informed approaches towards the use of L1, appropriate to their challenges, their learners' needs, and the lack of alternative resources. But here's the thing. Although we have begun to recognize the importance of L1 and started to use it as a resource in the classroom, and hereby we, I suppose, I share Bradley's fear of not talking on the part of Indians or, 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 or inferring that I can do, but we in the West and we within the discourses that I represent. Yes, um, although we've begun to recognize the importance of L1 and started to use it as a resource in the classroom, I think the vast majority of practitioners and writers on this topic have stopped short of moving out of the monolingual paradigm of the 20th century. This is evident in the widespread use of two collocations, judicious use or principal use of L1. The latter is a sort of tautology. Everything we do as teachers should surely be principled. Why is L1 singled out almost like a naughty pleasure that shouldn't be overindulged? I suggest that all of these stem from the interlanguage metaphor, within which the L1 is seen as a source of interference a cause of fossilization, and therefore only used judiciously when all other means have failed. It seems that we've only moved slightly from the position of English only to a position of English mainly, without ever evaluating the paradigm within which these parameters were set. Controversially, I would like to suggest that we need to get rid of these collocations and simply talk about effective use of all resources. And we need to see the L1 as the fundamental competence, not something that interferes, Sarita's ecosystem to which we introduce new languaging resources as required, which is, I would guess, how many of you learn to be multilinguals as children. Yesterday in his talk, C.P. Vishwanath mentioned how Indians have become the leading multilinguals on the planet. I agree with that. He mentioned the fact that they learn language in context drawing on the urgency to communicate and to communicate ideas, not words. But one thing he didn't mention is that the children in the slums in Darani that he invoked don't do this by separating out the languages carefully. The context for the new information is the languaging, the language they already know. Those children in the slums of Darani, I can guarantee you, are the greatest translinguals on the planet. But I perceive that there are several barriers preventing us from moving towards more L1-inclusive teaching. Some, such as the conservative nature of assessment and publishing practices, I won't be covering today. But another two I will, the notion of communicative competence as currently understood and defined, and our perceptions of learner needs to return to a, a topic which has already been mentioned today. So communicative competence, as I'm sure you all know, was first def defined by Delheims in the 1970s, but its influence on language teaching actually comes from the work of Canale and Swain in 1980, and then Canale, this one, in 1983. Many of us believe that this was based essentially on Chomsky's idealized native speaker in a fictional community in which he or she lived, something which doesn't really represent the practices of the vast majority of the world. In a recent article for EOT Journal, I argued that, trans that a translingual perspective can enable us to re-theorize communicative competence to abandon these fictions. In agreement with writers on English as a lingua franca, I argue that we should see the multilingual user of English as a more appropriate model for our learners, but tweak this slightly to talk about the translingual user of English. As we start to understand the complexities of real communities worldwide that Sridhar described, we begin to understand what actually happens when competent translinguals interact. Suresh Kanagaraja talks about the notion of alignment, a kind of translingual accommodation where you work out which languaging resources you're going to use with the taxi driver on your way to the conference here today. And I've seen it happen several times since being here. Um, so all of these grand theories about redefining communicative competence are all very well, but what about the learners in our classrooms? If they're to use English, 
They're learning to use a monolingual system, aren't they? And that's what we've got to prepare them for, right? Well, no, not really. Sometimes we don't know the answers until we ask the right questions. So I recently did a survey with adult learners at a large EFL institution in the UK, including both adult professionals, such as office workers, managers, and university students. You can see the nationalities involved, many of them from fairly monolingual countries. So I got the teachers to show them these three profiles, each with two very simple example students illustrating them. And then I got the teachers to ask them, which one most closely matches your current perceptions of your future English language use needs in relation to your other languages? Discuss, discuss just quickly for a moment in pairs. What percentage of the respondents do you think were found to be in each of the three profiles? This is what I found. 77% of these typical EFL learners, when they reflected carefully on their future language use profiles, actually identified themselves as being likely to need to use English translingually in the future. Now, many of these students come from countries with only one official language, such as Korea, Saudi Arabia, Italy, Thailand. For example, there was a Colombian student who needed to study some subjects in English and others in Spanish, and found herself regularly translanguaging and being exposed to translingual combinations of English and Spanish, both in lectures and in seminars. And there was a Korean manager working for a foreign multinational in Korea, interacting with both non-Koreans and Koreans on a daily basis through multiple means that led to lots of translanguaging. And there are other examples besides these in my article in the OT Journal. I'll provide the reference later. But the key point to take away here is that even privileged students from so-called monolingual countries are likely to need to translanguage within English in the future, some of them extensively. But what about teachers in India? What about learners in India, rather? Do we think they will need to translanguage with English in the future? Well, anybody who responded to our survey will know that this is one of the questions that we asked. Of the 174 respondents, 33% said they won't need to. 39% said a little. 17% said frequently, and only 10% said all the time. Hmm. This sounds a bit like the, the, the impressions of my colleagues in the UK. So let's look, first of all, at one Indian case study. Meet Arjun. I use a pseudonym here, but Arjun is a real person. He was my student very recently in the UK. He lives and works in Maharashtra as a manager for a top international company, which analyzes data for businesses worldwide in the tourism industry, managing a large team of skilled personnel. So what languages does he use at work and why? Well, my discussions with him revealed that he uses fairly standard English for emails and reports, which is something for us to note. But he often mixes this with a lot of Marathi and Hindi when interacting with his team, regularly translanguaging, drawing on English resources to refer to specific projects and activities, also for aspects of professionalism that are initially des designed and cognitively encapsulated in English, and also for technical terminology. This man has the kind of job that many young Indians aspire towards, and he translanguages frequently at work. So now comes an opportunity for you to consider what your learners would say if they took part in a similar survey. I'd now like you to talk in pairs for a few minutes. Choose a learner you know well. It could be a student in your class or maybe a family friend, and imagine them in a few years' time. Where will they be? What languages will they be using? How? and why. And remember, if your students are teachers, they are probably quite like the Malaysians we saw translanguaging in the WhatsApp group. And if your students are on an academic university course, they may have a lot in common with the Colombian learner that we learnt about. Discussing pairs, I'm going to give you three minutes, so maybe one and a half minutes to recall one student you know well each, and then I'll try and get some feedback. Thank you. Okay, if it's possible, my colleague Dipali has a microphone there. I wonder if anybody would like to give an example of a student that they can picture in the future.
good afternoon everyone my name is dr mohini and i am from mumbai <coughs> the kind of uh, uh, students that we have uh, especially in the college the engineering college that i teach in um, are mixed that is there are some who who can use english language uh, for for any purpose business uh, uh, or formal or informal any one of that but uh, there are some others who have a high iq and they are not very comfortable using english especially spoken english they are good at academic performance as far as using english medium uh, uh, english as a medium is concerned uh, so one particular person that i have in mind is my was my uh, my student in the last semester his name is shridhar sahu a nine pointer on the academics so a where a person having a high iq reasonably high iq uh, when i on try and answer these questions um say 5 years down the line my student shridhar would be working in a good company because though he is not very comfortable with english language he is absolutely comfortable with the content that he is supposed to know as a professional and i'm sure he has a very bright future ahead so shridhar is going to be really doing good in his career 5 years down the line what languages will he be using well since he has a reasonably good iq the more he gets surrounded with english language the more he'll be able to use it um, better so therefore if he uses say 40% english today in his day to day conversation he would definitely be using 60 or 70% english in future will they uh, need to trans language he definitely will he definitely will even if he for example he gets a job somewhere outside india there are indians over there also and they they speak english uh, they speak english majorly for official reasons when they interact one to one they prefer using their own language um how and why well, this is the reason thank you very much thank you very much can we do one more example there was a couple down here i think at the front oh we got one there just do one more example thank you this is time we we can get people are getting hungry yeah good afternoon uh, i have a, a student named abhinandan uh he is not a very good child an average boy and uh, okay uh, like we had a panel uh, he had to face a panel before we had the school elections i was really wonder struck the way he started speaking probably it was to impress the panel there he did a great job and i was really wonder struck a boy who was blabbering all the time was all ready with all high thunder words before the panel i was i had to really appreciate him and uh, where will he be probably he will take up an engineering course and he'll be comfortably doing some course there and uh, definitely uh, because he was trying to impress us he'll be very comfortable with his friends and people around only in probably his own mother tongue or the language which he is comfortable with and uh, will they need to trans language yes definitely he will do it because he is comfortable and he just wants to pose that he is good and he'll be doing it and probably at his comfort zone yes his mother tongue as Thank okay thank you very much i have to move on there may be other examples and possibly examples of students who you feel won't need to trans language so much it may be that they work in a more monolingual strictly english environment which is also true but one thing that's also interesting to reflect on is that we as teachers naturally trans language in our practice not just in the classroom but in the staff room if you record any conversation between a group of indian teachers english teachers it'll be fascinating to see okay so um let me move on We've seen examples of professionals from India and other countries who regularly need to trans language with English both at work and socially showing that trans languaging is a natural means of using English in our daily lives and arguably possibly the most valid context for the vast majority of learners for the vast majority of teachers in this room 
So if we are to prepare our learners for this translingual reality, what are we already doing as teachers, and could we be doing things more or doing things differently? Let's begin with a quick look at policy and prior research on use of L1 in Indian classrooms. Well, first of all, the Indian National Council of Educational Research and Training, as I'm sure you know, produced a very interesting position paper by the focus group on teaching of English in 2005 that recognizes a range of translingual practices as valid. Purism, whether of English or the Indian language, must yield to a tolerance of code switching and code mixing if necessary. So the door is truly open for translanguaging from a policy perspective. And I think this is very forward-looking for this council. Now before I move on to our recent research, just a quick summary of three interesting papers that I was able to find in my background research for this talk. In 2013, Raman found that Assamese was used frequently by 65% of teachers, mainly to explain concepts, but also to save time, engage students, and interestingly, because students demanded it. The study also surveyed these students. 95% of them said that they needed the help of Assamese in English classes, with the majority, 60%, saying they needed it about 25% of the time. Chimerala found that 95% of teachers use other languages and 71% allow their students to use them. The main reasons for them use, using them were reported as explaining concepts in difficult words, which is similar to Rama. The only two other common reasons given were for reprimanding or bonding with students and for checking comprehension. And Durai Rajan summarizes a range of interventionist studies, mainly small-scale PhD studies, exploring the impact of ways of using the L1. There were four studies using L1 to make vocabulary meanings clear, three tapping prior knowledge and several others. Durai Rajan concludes, these varied growths, mostly small gains, may not be st statistically significant, but in terms of pedagogic implications and student growth and feeling of confidence, nearly exponential. So based on these prior findings, Amy Lightfoot from British Council India and I conducted a study recently. I know that some of you took part, so thank you if you did. We had 174 respondents, with 66 adding qualitative data, including this important comment, I don't know if the speaker is in the room, that we should bear in mind. Self-report surveys are not reports of actual practice. I presume that she or he is saying that other respondents may be under-reporting use of L1, this idea of a guilty pleasure. Given as Jindal also notes, many teachers in India still feel guilty about using L1. And in a way, this for me is one of the most important findings of this paper, of this research study. The respondents were a really nice balance. About 48% secondary, 41% tertiary or adult, and about 11% primary. And they were teaching a, a nice balance of different school types. The majority were experienced teachers and the vast majority spoke three or more languages. English was the medium of instruction in approximately half the schools and they reported teaching a wide distribution of levels. So the first question I always like to ask on such surveys is whether the teachers have the choice to use what languaging resources they want to use. I know that certain institutions in certain countries attempt to outlaw the use of other languages. So despite the policy document mentioned earlier, 18% said they are not allowed to use English in the classrooms, and I've already met, met two people who have said something similar at this conference. Another 36% indicated that, they use, that using other languages is, is discouraged, leaving only 46%, less than half, who feel free to do what national policy is advising them to do. A couple of the comments from the respondents are shown here, and the colors correspond to the categories. So we also asked them about the community, another important thing to ask about. And we found out, rather unsurprisingly, that translanguaging was reported to be present in almost all communities where the schools were located, either involving a lot of English or regular use of English. 86% indicated that they do share another language with some of the learners, although only 55% said that it was shared with most or all the students. And this is one of the really challenging complexities about the incredible linguistic diversity of India, that some teachers do have this access, and some teachers are much more challenged in not having it. So there's not going to be any simple one solution here. And 70% said translanguaging is very common, or quite common, among students in English lessons, so that their students are doing it. But the next question then is, 
What are your own choices for using L1? So we asked them a number of questions about this, including the more traditional questions about translation, classroom management, etc. But we also tried to ask some new questions that relate to both to more L1 inclusive and natural translinguaging practices, sorry, translingual practices. I've categorized them here under four different headings, framework task following Hall and Cook, using L1 as a scaffolding resource, here looking at it from a socio-cultural perspective, what I've called cross-languaging, in which attempts are made to find equivalence between different languages, for example, translation or comparison of grammar in two languages. And also what I've called meshing, following Suresh Kanagaraja in 2013, where two or more languages are used, mixed in the same text or utterance, like we saw in the example from Jab We Met, the more traditional understanding of translanguaging. Now I'll return to these in a moment, but first, I wanted to get a snapshot picture of how comparatively common these different practices were. So in, re responses to, in reply to statements such as this item, respondents had the choice of four options. I converted these into scores that enabled me to compare different uses transparently. A score of zero would indicate that the average response was never. So I never did this, or I, we never do this. One would indicate occasionally, and two would indicate an average response of regularly. So here's what we found. So the first thing to note is that teachers are reporting occasional to rare use of translingual practices. The two highest uses reported were getting students to compare the way languages express things and comparing sounds between different languages. And here's another example of asking the right questions. This question is very rarely asked in, asked in surveys of L1 use, including Hall and Cook's massive study with nearly 3,000 teachers worldwide from 2013. But they did note that this was one of the most commonly mentioned additional comments. Also note that L1 use when preparing lessons scores highly under category two. Something else that, I, that is never asked on other questionnaires that I know of, yet I'd argue that this is a key teaching skill that should be addressed in teacher education programs. Also note that while teachers occasionally allow use of other languages in the classroom, very few actively encourage this. And the least common translingual practices involved written language use, an area often seen as being more conservatively monolingual. And this is certainly reflected here with only a few teachers allowing students to take notes in L1 or in other languages, under, if you look at under two. Yet, from a socio-cultural perspective, this is a valid scaffolding tool that helps learners to understand difficult conceptual ideas such as when they're learning grammar. So while there is much more to report from this survey, the key points to take away, I feel, are that teachers feel restricted in the use of L1. And this was supported by the qualitative comments provided. They're reporting generally only occasional use of L1, with most seeing validity for the framework tasks using L1 as a scaffolding resource and cross-languaging. But meshing is still very rare. It seems that despite the green light from the National Focus Group position paper, L1 use appears to be limited for many teachers and not even allowed for others. Although, as mentioned before, we, we need to be very cautious with such self-report -survey, self survey results. Now, I'd now like to move on for the last part of my talk to a key question that is often asked, as James Simpson does. What might effective pedagogies that draw upon translanguaging look like? It's often asked but rarely answered, so I've made a, a note of one of, my, one of my aims of one of this talk today to, to cover it. But before I begin, I do want to sound a, a note of caution, as I always do when suggesting ideas for the classroom. Contexts vary a lot, and I mean context for teaching here. Even within a country, within a city, or even within a single school. So please remember to be careful and critical when trying out someone else's suggestions for your own classrooms. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a number of the respondents to our survey added qualitative data and they also provided email addresses for us to contact them uh, if we have any further questions. I did contact a number of the, the respondents that I thought were very L1 inclusive, as I use that term. Generally speaking, as you might expect, L1 use was, was higher at lower levels of English language proficiency, but there were some exceptions, including a practitioner that stood out 
they stood out as having the highest level of L1 inclusion of all the respondents and some very innovative activities in her advanced classes. So this is in advanced classes, not elementary. When I contacted this individual, I was delighted to find a leading practitioner in language teaching pedagogy from the EFL University in Hyderabad, Professor Julie Sen, I'm sure the colleague of many of you present, who unfortunately is not able to be here today due to work commitments, but I'd like to begin with two innovative ideas from her. These ideas, and all you'll see, are free to uh, download in a booklet that I've prepared, and I'll show you the link afterwards. So the first idea, let's call it culture share. Professor Sen says it works with students from diverse cultures really well. So if you're working in a very diverse uh, urban environment, this might be useful for you. Get students to bring items of personal cultural importance to class. And you can see a leather lamp from Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and I think you can see is that a Pochampali Sari as well. Um, students talk about their items, first of all explaining their importance and using any language they want to, including in L1 and in L2 like Hindi and English as required. Then they prepare either a text or give a brief presentation on the item in English. And there's the translanguaging, that you scaffold the actual conceptual understanding first using L1 or using any resources, and then you get them to work into English. The second idea, also from Professor Sen, I've called Meshed News Report. This one probably works better with students at higher levels of proficiency in English. Working in pairs or small groups, students listen to a news report in English and attempt to report the key details in another language simultaneously. So here they're moving from English to known language. Because of the challenges of this task, students are naturally forced to translanguage and what they typically do is they add in bits of English into the Hindi or the Bangla or whichever language they're using to report it, which is also something that really commonly happens outside the classroom. These activities, and all you'll see, are meaningful communicative activities that, that would, would fall under the definition, for example, of a task. The third idea I'd like to share is also from a colleague from India, Dr. Hira Rajwani from Junagadh in Gujarat also a very L1 inclusive teacher. I've called it five sentences. Any discussion topic is chosen, and working in pairs, students write five sentences on the topic in their L1. They then read them out to classmates, working in small groups, and here we're probably thinking about lower levels of proficiency in primary and secondary classes. The next day the task is repeated, but this time they, they try to write the sentences in English, and the teacher supports as necessary. Then on the third day, students try to remember their five sentences without opening their books, using as much English as possible. So here we've got memorization techniques coming in. I thought it was a very nice idea for a gradually scaffolded task over several days. Now to present a few ideas of my own um, for translingual activities that have worked well in classrooms that I've been in, both monolingual and multilingual, and also both in, in privileged contexts and in low-income contexts I've worked in in Africa. The first one is called Translingual Text Challenger and works well with any class. Imagine students have read an interesting text in English and you want them to practice using some of the language in it. For five minutes, students work alone. One student in each pair converts the text into key notes, not translating it, just key notes using L1. And the other student prepares some questions for an interview on the text using English. Then after five minutes they get together. The students who've got the notes in L1 can no longer look at the original text, but the other student who's asking the questions can help them if necessary. And then they ask the questions and answer them, drawing on the L1 notes. So the information they're provided has been encoded from English into L1 and then back into English. So we're encouraging students to be flexible with their languaging resources. Um, by forcing students to transfer concepts into L1, this kind of activity gets students to process the meaning of the text more deeply. And it also practices skills that are useful in the world outside the classroom. The second idea I'd like to show you links to some of the ideas two of the speakers yesterday mentioned storytelling. So I've called this translingual storytelling. and It's a really interesting idea that we've been sharing at this conference. It draws on learners' cultural knowledge, their prior knowledge, to facilitate learning. And let's think again about really challenging contexts, like our colleague who works with, with, uh, with teachers in the tribal community. This idea recognizes that the cultural knowledge of the student is initially encoded in the L1. Um, so one student is asked to, to tell a story 
from the local community in L1, and they're given a day or two to prepare this. So they come to class well prepared. The student tells the story in the lesson, and the other students work in groups to write the story in English. They may use L1 words and phrases wherever they don't know the English. So here I'm, I'm suggesting the idea of controversially allowing more meshing of languages in written text and the teacher supports. And then after this, there are many options. For example, the teacher could tell the same story in English and students listen to the words that they didn't know in English and they add them into their text where they previously used L1. You could also get the students to present their stories and to celebrate them as translingual texts, as mesh texts that they could put, if you have access, online or on the classroom wall if you don't. So there we go. Um, and then the final activity I'd like to show you very quickly is a guy who I've called Mr. Banglish. You saw him earlier. We created this in a UNICEF primary education project in Bangladesh in 2015. It's simply a poster, but the labels are pieces of card stuck on with sellotape that children can flip to learn both languages and gain some, under some understanding of equivalence that this part of my body has a word both in Bangla and in English. One of the many ways that classroom aids can also be translingual, they don't have to be monolingually English. And there you can be working with your colleagues, especially in primary level, who are also helping to support the learners in the literacy in, in first language where they have a different script, which is all of India. So there we go, that's just a flavour of some of the ideas for translingual activities that we can use in addition to typical things such as allowing use of bilingual dictionaries, doing translation activities, explaining complex grammar using L1, and getting students to compare the ways different languages do things, such as expressing ideas or pronouncing sounds. And I think we can also include L1 in our thoughts when we prepare our lessons. What difficulties can we anticipate with this bit of grammar I'm going to teach? What resources can we draw upon to help to overcome the difficulties? So I'm nearly at the end of my talk. I know you must be hungry. Today I've argued for translanguaging for both a theoretical perspective and a practical perspective as something that is natural, real, and needed by our learners. I'd like to conclude with three key points. Firstly, this idea of inclusivity. I believe that all language classrooms should be inclusive of all languages. The classroom must be a place to embrace languages and languaging as an activity, a complex, fluid practice. We need to talk about effective use of all resources and not single out L1 as some pleasure for judicious use only. Our use of linguistic resources should reflect the aims that we are trying to achieve, nothing more, nothing less. As my colleague Dr. Kapoor, Dr. Kapoor mentioned, uh, it's about building a bridge between the two languages. Don't let students fall into the river between them, because I've seen the river Peri on my bird watching trip here and I wouldn't want anyone to fall into that river. And as our colleague said who mentioned about students dropping out. So often dropping out is because students are falling into the river. The second point, in the context of countries such as India, which are linguistically rich, it should not be taken for granted that communicative competence is our desired aim, as many of our learners are likely to need translingual competence, as we've seen today, which requires a different theoretical understanding of what language is. It isn't just about meshing them, it's about changing what we understand by the term language and how we use it to interact. And I believe that India can take a leading role in helping us to theorize this competence and to realize it in the classroom. Related to this, we need to develop ideas for translanguaging together, the practitioners in the room, and share our successes and our challenges. And as, as again, Dr. Kapoor said, we need to be critical of any approach. So anything that I'm or anybody else is suggesting to you, you take it to your classroom, you try it out. That bit of action research we had mentioned is really important about it. And finally, we need to address teacher education. Our research, as limited as it is, confirms the sense that many teachers still feel guilty about using L1 in India. And I agree once more to quote Durairajan, who states, a course in multilingual education practices ought to be mandated in all teacher education programs. And I would say worldwide, but in India, how is it not mandated? I don't know. Now, before I finish, let me give you a link to my resources and references for the talk. If you go to my website, jasonanderson.org.uk, go to my talks page and you'll find a link to my references for this talk and my resources for the workshop. The, the, it takes you to a different pages and you can download it as a PDF. It includes a free booklet of lots of activities that I've developed and other practitioners have also used. 
And if you have your own ideas, please share them with me. I'll put them in the booklet and I will credit you accordingly. Also on the publications page of my website, you'll find a link to my related article called Reimagining English Language Learners from a Translingual Perspective, published in EOT Journal of Advanced Access. Click on the link, the title link, for free access. So may I, think, may, may I finish by taking this opportunity to thank ELTAI and to thank British Council India for allowing me to speak at this conference. And thank you once more for listening and participating.